What Once Was Mine, Chapter 44, Gina and Flynn. Stay still, Flynn groaned but try kept trying to sit up. Gina put a hand on his chest and pushed him back down. He groaned louder. Daughter, remind me not to come to you with a migraine, the good wife muttered. After the men had fled with Rapunzel, Gina had managed to grab the reins of one of the horses. She had hoisted Flynn on top of her as quickly and carefully as she could and taken off into the forest. And as soon as they were deep enough, she called out, Mother! Someone tell Mother I need help! One of us is hurt! Whether birds, trees, or the invisible fungal threads that connected all things under the forest floor wound up being the vector for communicating this request, Gina didn't know. But she was unsurprised when the shadow suddenly grew long and shapes became indistinct and the good wife stepped out of the bushes as if she had been mere, merely behind the tree the whole time, waiting for them. All the usual greetings, ironic exchanges, and conversational sparring between mother and daughter were silenced. The good wife took one look at the wounds on Flynn's head and her face grew grim. Follow me, was all she said, and Gina complied without a peep. Now the three were in a tiny magical clearing in the forest. Lime green moss and tiny sweet scented flowers not seen elsewhere in the dark woods grew in profusion. In the middle of it's a crystal clear spring burbled whose waters were supposed to have healing properties. No one said it aloud, but it was very clear that this was exactly the sort of place the king or queen of the forest would live. A gold, golden antlered stag, a snow white heart, or Flynn was laying down on the thickest tuffets of moss. His head cradled in the good wife's shawl. She bathed his head in, in hair and water from the stream and laid whole, unbellished leaves of strange herbs on his eyes and forehead, and in his shoulders and in his shoulder wound. When he finally began to breathe regularly, she tipped a tiny clay pot of highly aromatic extract from his, into his tongue. Bon set for the skull, she muttered. Genitin, gentian for the eyes. Mud from a cemetery stream to keep the necrosis out. Samui, Tarasia, Fune, Ice, Moida. Where's Rapunzel? They stole her, Gina answered, used to her mother's multitasking and sudden conversation switches. Bathory's men, Flynn whispered. Green dragon, teeth. The good wife looked grim. You need to go after her. Flynn's okay with you? Gina asked, getting up and get putting her cloak on. No! Flynn pushed herself up, himself up on his elbows, ripping open the wound on his head that had just begun to, magically, knit itself together. Scarlet blood trickled down his face. I'll go. You gotta be kidding me, Gina said. Look at you. I'm okay. He rolled over onto his side, trying to push himself up. You don't think I can rescue her by myself? Gina demanded. You still think I can't do anything? Oh, do calm down, Gina, her mother said in irritation. Not everything is about you and what you can, can and can't do. He's not even thinking about that. He loves Rapunzel. He just wants to help. Gina's eyes widened in genuine surprise. Really? She asked, leaning over him. You love her? Like, love? Um, I don't know. Why are we talking? Should we be writing? Flynn forced his eyes open, tried to look like he was together. He did a remarkably good job giving an old Flynn writer style smile. All teeth, eyebrows raised suggestively, mouth pulled to the side in a way he obviously thought was devilishly handsome. He winked at the two ladies, but they were distracted by how that only spattered more blood on his cheek. If you get a ho on a horse now, none of my fixes will stay, the good wife warned him. It was like she had skipped over the part where they argued and gone straight to the end where they had all given up and agreed he was going, despite the fact that he was so weak that with one bony old hand she could have kept him going down to the, uh, kept him down on the ground. Your head wounds are serious, writer, with serious consequences. You get up now, I can't promise you you'll stay alive. Or that you won't turn into some more of a drooling idiot, Gina added. Chance I'll have to take. He put a hand, somewhat unsteadily, on Gina's shoulder and looked into her eyes. I know you'll do everything you can to rescue her. There's a castle and a bloodthirsty psycho, and the odds are totally stacked against you. But if there's anyone I believe could do it, it would be you, Gina. You're amazing. It's crazy the rest of the world hasn't even realized that yet. But if I don't go and help... I'll never forgive myself. Oh, Gina said, trying not to smile. You're so dumb, but right this one time. 
All right, boy, the good wife said with a sigh. Give me ten more minutes and two more cat cantrips. I can at least stabilize you. Or I could stabilize a goat. It's been a while since I've done this with a person. I'm sure it'll be fine. And I'll pack up a little kit of droughts and poultices to keep you going. For a bit. Gina, come watch how to apply them. For Flynn, the ten minutes might have as well have been forever. The world around him faded out in different shades of dark, and he watched them and debated whether or not to stay conscious. And then he was waking up. Whoa, he said, blinking. I feel not bad. Gina helped him sit up fully. They had washed his face and neck. He felt new and clean and ready to go. And then a bolt of pain hit him on the forehead, worse than the worst morning after, like he had been punched through the skull with a mallet made of tacks. I wasn't kidding when I said it was a serious head wound, Ryder, the good wife said softly. I have no magic that will really fix it all immediately. I don't know if anyone does, besides Rapunzel when the moon is full. You'll be kept alive and mostly functioning, but it isn't perfect. It's all good, Flynn put a hand to his head, gritted his teeth, willed himself to get up despite the pain. Gina put a hand on his arm and helped him when he seemed to need it, but otherwise stood there patiently as an object for him to lean on. You're going to need a ride seated behind Gina, the good wife insisted, hands on hips, keeping your neck straight, and sleep as much as you can. Oh, you don't need to worry about my male pride issues here, he, she, he assured them. If you told me Gina had to carry me piggyback, I'd be right, all right with that too. Gina took the little packets and skins from her mother and tucked them away in her horse's panniers, tightened the straddle, saddle strap, and straightened the blanket. Then she helped Flynn get up, lacing her fingers for him to step in like a child so he wouldn't have to twist into the stirrups. Finally, she swung herself up, as gracefully as anyone who had been riding her entire life. She grinned, obviously loving the feeling. Then Flynn flopped against her back. Your braid's a little scratchy. Can you maybe make it like a soft pillow-like bun, he murmured. Good, good luck, the good wife said, meaning it. I'm relocating our home. I may not be easy to find when you get back, but we'll see each other again. Home will always be home. Bye, Ma, Gina said. No jokes, no digs. She wheeled the horse around and they galloped into the darkness. What seemed like a scant seconds later, Flynn was was jolted painfully awake by the horse rearing up and screaming. Three soldiers blocked their way, led by Captain Tresberg. Their weapons were drawn and they were cool as ice, a well-trained group, not the chaotic mercenaries of the older nobles. Gina and Flynn knew they didn't have a chance. No, Tregsy, please, Flynn said, trying to sit up, putting a hand out. Not now. Flynn Rider, the captain drawled, his horse as if it could sense its human friend's extreme pleasure in this casually kicked its front hooves. You were under arrest for... So many different things. I can't even be bolstered to list them all here. Dismount quickly to turn yourself in and we'll go lightly in your, on your accomplice. Because I'm a girl? Gina demanded angrily. No, because we have no idea who you are and there are no warrants for your arrest. Please, Captain, sir, Flynn said, summoning all his strength. The soldiers drew their swords. One false move and Flynn would be hacked apart, thrown from the horse, beaten or trod upon. It didn't matter. It wouldn't be good. Please, listen. We're on our way to save Rapunzel. The captain's eyes widened. Rapunzel, Gina repeated. The crown princess. There is no crown princess here, one of the other soldiers spat. It wasn't a pretty look for his otherwise Roman perfect bearing and shiny armor hit bits. The girl died as an infant. The captain held up his hand to quiet him. How do you know of this? He demanded. Flynn took a deep breath. The king and queen had a daughter who killed her nurse in a fit of a baby magic, probably from the moon drop flower, and queen, the queen ate when she was ill, to keep anyone else from being hurt. The royal couple had Rapunzel sent away and raised by a witch who could handle the baby's magic. This was 19 years ago. The soldiers all looked to their captain in disbelief. He isn't wrong. Chesberg said, adjusting his grip on the horse's reins. His men's eyes widened in shock, but they remained silent. I was there. Continue, Ryder. Though I fail to see what this has to do with saving your sorry hide. Long story short, she escaped the tower where the witch basically had her imprisoned, 
we we um were introduced and we were set to take her to see the floating lanterns which is all she wanted you're leaving about out the bit of the crown gina pointed out shut up gina no one cares about the crown okay there might have been a crown involved anyway they were attacked by several different groups of men from different noble houses it seems like a surprising number of people also had many known about the princess and her powers and wanted a piece of that now and she was out of the tower we were actually on our way to return her to the castle. No, really, he added, seeing the look on the captain's face. It's true, Gina added. It seemed like the safest option for her. We stopped in Hare Cross to, to scout out the terrain. Our plan was to join the next merchant caravan or any guards we saw and make sh sure she got safely to the capital. You can ask at the village. Everyone saw us there. Tresberg narrowed his eyes. A strange combination of suspicious and thoughtful. Like he didn't want to believe what Flynn was saying, but that unfortunately had the tang of truth about it. And everyone saw what happened there, Flynn went on desperately. Bathory's men came out of their with their verehounds and found Rapunzel and grabbed her. The two of us tried to fight them off, but it wasn't enough. They escaped with her and gave me this. He lifted up the edge of the, of the poultice. One of the guards sucked in his breath. Another went pale. The captain said nothing. He had obviously seen wounds like that and worse in his times. He neither acknowledged nor dismissed its severity. Look, Flynn said after a deep, ragged breath. Rapunzel has the crown. I gave it back to her. You can lock me up when this is all over. I promise. But please, I am actually begging you. Let us go rescue her. Help us even. Rapunzel is at the mercy of Countess Bathory. I don't need to tell you what that means. As if sensing its rider's discomfort and indecision, the captain's horse took steps to the left and to the right, impatient and antsy. "'We have no proof this is in fact the crown princess,' Tresberg said aloud. "'Yeah, and God forbid the kingdom's finest go rescue a citizen of the realm who's not a princess,' Flynn growled, suddenly feeling exhausted. "'It wasn't fair. The world was a random, unkind place. He had always known that.' Or at least he had believed that until he had spent time with Rapunzel and Gina and her mother. It was just too much that the world asked of Flynn Rider. Forgotten orphan, turned adventurer, to flight brigands, witches, sadistic murderesses, and now bureaucracy to save an entirely innocent girl. The captain was silent a moment, thinking. Sternwalt, he finally said, turning to one of his men. Go to Haircross immediately and ask around. Verify if what he says is true. When you are done, return to the castle and report to the lieutenant. Yes, sir. Varys, you return to the castle and tell the lieutenant everything that occurred there. Tell him that, by my order, he is to get the cavalry ready for a potential assault on Castle Bathory. None of the large siege weapons, the smaller the smaller tribution, and ram will do. The soldier smiled a hard smile. I have a family in Cachety. They will be more than pleased by the destruction of that monster. Absolutely, sir. The two men turned their horses and took off. Flynn regarded the one remaining in the captain with weariness and a tiny bit of hope. His head was throbbing and he would pass out soon without another poultice or drought. We'll go to Bathory together, Tresberg said, to investigate if you're telling the truth. If you are, Conrad, here we'll get a message to the castle and send the troops. Am I clear? As goat's cheese, Flynn said, saluting sloppily and then flopping toward onto Gina. He missed the one fleeting human look the old guard gave Gina, actual worry, and a questioning raise of his eyebrows. Nor did he see or hear how Gina responded. Forward, then, the captain said aloud. I am not obeying orders, Gina muttered. Flynn did hear this and smiled a little, right before he passed out.